Good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone to today's Legacy Lecture. My name is Allison Kaplan. I'm Director of Education at the National First Ladies Library, where we're located in Canton, Ohio, at First Ladies National Historic Site, a national park site dedicated to the First Ladies of the United States. Before we get started today, um, I want to tell you a little bit about some upcoming programs and exhibitions here. Um, and I also just want to do a little bit of housekeeping um, with virtual events. There's always um, some AV or technical issues, whether it's coming from my end or um, from the other side. So I want to um, encourage you, if you're having problems hearing or seeing today, um, if you've logged in through Eventbrite, we recommend clicking into Zoom. So you're opening up the Zoom page. Even today, it looked like I was tinkering with the um, Eventbrite and my link was bad in there, but we've sent messages out a few different ways. So hopefully you weren't deluged and you got connected and you can hear and see me. We also live stream on Facebook and we always post um, as long as we have the speaker's permission to uh, YouTube after the fact. So um, if you have to leave, if you want to share the link with someone else, um, we encourage you to do that. Um, we also encourage you to use the chat. We do have a Q&A and I always collect questions for the speaker at the end of the talk, but we encourage you to use the chat. Um, if you have a question, please tell us where you're tuning in from as well. Um, obviously we're connected with a site here in Canton, but thanks to the pandemic, um, this uh, organization has a great national identity as well as a really cool mailing list. So if you're not on our mailing list, please sign up um, so you can keep connected about some of these upcoming programs at the site. If you are in the region or you are traveling this summer, we encourage you to come to the site. National First Ladies Library has a great exhibition on view called Beyond Camelot about the life and legacy of Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. And this is the only place in the country where you're gonna get the whole story of Jackie's life from her birth and her childhood, her time at Miss Porter School, um, her career as the inquiring camera girl um, to her Time in the White House and beyond that to her time as Jackie O and as an editor. Um, so we encourage you to come and check out that exhibition, which um, is organized uh, around a gift to um, National, for National First Ladies Library by Monty Durham of Say Yes to the Dress fame and includes an amazing reproduction of Jacqueline Kennedy's wedding dress. Um, that was originally designed by Ann Lowe. Ours comes to us via Monty and was recreated by couture designer Priscilla of Boston. So um, I highly recommend coming out. If you are local, we do a monthly third Thursday uh, curator-led tour um, with snacks and drinks. And that one for this month is tomorrow. So there's still time to register for that. We also have a children's program this weekend about Ann Lowe, the designer of the dress. Um, that should be really fun. So there are lots of things you can do in person, but we also have our regular virtual legacy lecture. Um, and this one's going to be in two parts. We were so excited about First Lady Jewelry and telling the story that we uh, wanted to do um, both an early First Lady talk and then a later um, 20th century and into the 21st century first lady talk. So please register for those. We also have a really cool, um, uh, cooking with the first ladies coming up in July, uh, based on Florence Harding, um, an Ohio first lady. And, uh, let me see if there are any other cool programs that I want to share with you. You can always go to our website, firstladies.org, and find out more about what is going on at um, the site and what kinds of virtual programs are coming up. There are a lot of cool programs that are um, being planned for the fall, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to confirm and post all of those soon. So I want to encourage you to do that. Again, please share where you're tuning in 
coming from um, questions, you can put questions um, in the Q&A at the bottom, or you can put them in the chat and I will continue to chat with you. Also try to, if you're tuning in on Facebook, I'll try to log over there just to um, make sure that I'm catching things. So that is all the housekeeping I have for today. Without further ado, I wanna to introduce today's speaker, Elise Zorn Carlin. Uh, Elise is the publisher and editor-in-chief of Adornment, the magazine of jewelry and related arts. She is a past president of the American Society of Jewelry Historians and is currently the co-director of the Association for the Study of Jewelry and Related Arts. She runs the annual conference on jewelry, jewelry and related arts and the annual jewelry history series in Miami, Florida every winter. Carlin is also the author of the definitive book on jewelry of the arts and crafts movement, jewelry and metalwork in the arts and crafts tradition. She additionally authored the catalogs International Art Jewelry 1895 to 1925 and Out of This World Jewelry in the Space Age. So I am very excited to um, turn things over to Elise. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. There you are. Oh, hold on one sec. And again, if as okay. Elisa is setting up, if you have questions, um, please enter them in the chat and we will uh, round out our talk today with an answering some questions. Thanks. First, I'd like to thank the National First Ladies Library for having me speak today, especially Allison. I'm going to start my lecture by explaining why studying the jewelry of the early first ladies is so complicated. First, there are no photographs of them before Dolly Madison. There are shaky provenances. That means that sometimes family stories are not always accurate. And also pieces are given to collections without any true proof of where they came from. Uh, I call it hearsay gifts. Jewelry has been reworked or taken apart Objects are in many locations, so you have to search everywhere. Some of the jewelry may still be hidden away with family members. Jewelry may have been sold or given away. It's not always worn in portraits, which would be a great clue. Some first ladies didn't even wear much jewelry. And last, a lot of collections don't focus on jewelry because they have so few pieces. We have to be very cautious about accepting whether jewelry really belonged to a first lady or not. In many ways, America is fortunate in having Martha Washington as the nation's very first first lady. She defined the position and set standards for all those who followed. Martha's example was crucial because the constitution, which outlines the duties of the president is silent on the president's spouse. It took a woman who was capable of carrying out her duties in the public arena to set the right tone with confidence and grace. And here we see Martha in a miniature painting wearing pearls up close around her neck and jeweled hair ornaments. She was 45 years old in this painting. Martha Dandridge was only 19 years old when she married well-to-do Daniel Custis. She became a wife, a mother, and a plantation mistress. She had four children in four years, but only two survived childhood. John Park Custis, known as Jackie, and Martha Park Custis, known as Patsy. After seven years of marriage, her husband died and she became a very wealthy woman. When her husband died, George Washington, a family friend, visited Martha on March 16, 1758. Within months, they began to plan a future together. Martha placed an order for wedding clothes from London, including these purple silk shoes and a dress that was, according to her, to be grave but not extravagant, nor to be mourning, meaning not black or dark material. Washington's own social status had improved with the death of his half-brother, Lawrence. He inherited Mount Vernon, a beautiful 2,000-acre estate in Northern Virginia. And this is where Martha went to live with him, although she still owned her own plantations. They married on January 6, 1759. Most of what we know about Martha's jewelry comes from records at Mount Vernon and in the Library of Congress. It's known that George and Martha ordered luxury goods from England for some time. For example, we know that in 1770, Martha purchased a parure, a set of jewelry consisting of a necklace, earrings, sprig hair combs, and pins and buttons for a stomacher made of paste. 
This set was actually for her daughter, Patsy. A stomacher is a large brooch worn on a dress bodice, and the pieces can also be worn separately. This is an example of one. Paste jewelry is glass that is cut like a gemstone and then highly polished until it looks like diamond or other gemstone, and it came in many colors. Records show that Martha received an MRI necklace when she married, which would have been paste imitating emeralds. The sprig pin refers to a small spray brooch worn by colonial women. They could be worn in a variety of ways, including as the hair, as Martha did in the miniature. None of the pieces of the paste jewelry suite I just spoke about are at Mount Vernon today or known to exist. But this buckle, which is either a shoe or waist buckle, is at Mount Vernon. It's silver over gold and paste and dates from 1740 to 1760. These buckles were sold in the colonies or ordered from Europe. <clears throat> We know that over the years, Martha, Martha acquired a number of paste necklaces and earrings made in France. Martha also owned these gold hoop earrings. When George Washington married Martha, he became a surrogate father for Jackie and Patsy. Sadly, Patsy died at the age of 17 from what was probably epilepsy. These are miniatures of Patsy and Jackie painted by Charles Wilson Peale. As this was pre-photography, they were cherished keepsakes. She keepsakes. Martha had the miniature painting set in gold bracelet clasp designed to hold strands of delicate gold chain. They could also be worn sewn onto ribbons on straps of woven hair or with strings of pearls. And the second picture below gives you an example of how they would have looked when they were still as bracelets. Jackie married Eleanor Calvert, who was from a prominent Maryland family. They had four children. Jackie died during the Revolutionary War in 1781 of typhoid. Nellie and Wash, his two youngest children, came to live with their grandparents, George and Martha. Martha loved garnet jewelry, and there were quite a few pieces of it at Mount Vernon. Receipts for the purchase of garnet jewelry ordered in the 1760s and 1770s are in the Mount Vernon records. Garnet jewelry was ordered for Patsy, but due to the non-importation agreement, this is when the colonists refused to order goods from England. The jewelry did not arrive until she was 13, only a few years before her death. It is possible that Martha later wore her jewelry too. It's also known that George ordered a pair of garnet earrings from James Craig of Williamsburg, Virginia, and Martha ordered a garnet ring from him as well. This necklace of Martha's was originally designed with closed couple clusters fitting closely on her neck as the pearls did and with a pendant that could be attached to it, which is this piece right here. Sometime around 1825, the clusters were separated by two rows of chains to make a festoon necklace, which was the new style. And it was in style because the neckline of dresses was low cut, so the necklace was larger to fill in the space on the neck. Most likely this was done by Martha's granddaughter, Martha Park Custis Peters. Note what was once a single pair of earrings here are now two separate sets, and these are sprays that could be worn in the hair. The earrings were probably taken apart to give to two different uh, family members. Martha also had a lot of seed pearl jewelry, which is at Mount Vernon. Seed pearl jewelry was a popular style of jewelry in the late 18th century into the 19th century. The tiny pearls used were less than a quarter of a grain in size and were exported from India and China. They were drilled and strung on white horsehair, preferably white. This dove of peace brooch probably was very meaningful to Martha. It represents either her hope for the end of the war or to celebrate the ending, depending on when it was purchased. George also commis commissioned a Philadelphia artisan to make this dove of peace weather vane holding an olive branch in its mouth. Again, you can see the earrings were separated in two parts and probably given to two family members. Martha had four granddaughters. These rings belonged to Martha. The first wing ring was probably bequeathed to Martha by her nephew, Augustine Washington, who died in 1793. It was the custom in the 18th and 19th centuries to leave money in one's will to allow a mourner to purchase a memorial ring to hold a bit of the deceased hair. The second ring with blue and enamel and blue enamel and pearls was a popular style in the 19th, 18th century. The final ring was once considered to be Martha's engagement ring from her first marriage, 
but as this was not based on information that could be verified, it is now simply designated as a ring she owned, but keep the design in mind for later. During the seven years of the Revolutionary War, Martha followed George to his winter encampments. She helped to keep morale up among the soldiers and she was running the plantations back home when she wasn't with him. But despite her relief of the war being over, Martha was thrown into the limelight she did not desire in 1789 when George became president. Her eight years as the first lady were extremely unpleasant to her. By the time she arrived in the capital, her husband's secretary, who had lived in Europe, had created a series of protocols she disliked, including not allowing the Washingtons to dine in private homes. In letters, she said she felt like a prisoner and was very lonely. Establishing her public role as hostess, Martha held formal dinners on Thursdays and public receptions or levies on Fridays. Yet she was still criticized by some as being too regal, although she did her best not to behave like royalty. This watch was given to Mount Vernon just last year. It was given by the last member of the Peters family, a descendant of Martha's granddaughter. We know from correspondence that Martha gave this watch to her granddaughter and when she ordered a new plainer one for herself. George Washington died on December 14, 1799. Just two and a half years after her husband, Martha Washington died on May 22, 1802. One newspaper said upon her death, the worthy partner of the worthiest of men has died. George Washington, in his will, directed the building of a new tomb at Mount Vernon. This is the final resting place of George and Martha Washington. Following Martha Washington's death, her descendants frequently refashioned jewelry so that successive generations might wear a few of the stones or pearls that had graced her ears or encircled her neck. In the mid 19th century, Catherine Williams Upshur, a great great granddaughter of Martha Washington, remade her inherited seed pearl necklace into a set of four cross pendants that could be shared equally among her children. And three of those four crosses are now in the collection of Mount Vernon. Abigail Smith Adams was born into a New England family with deep colonial roots. She was the daughter of the Reverend William Smith and Elizabeth Quincy. Her education took place in her home under the guidance of her mother. In addition to the domestic arts, her studies included reading, writing, math, and French. Abigail met James, John Adams when he, she was 16. He was 10 years older, a graduate of Harvard and a lawyer. After several years of courtship, they married and moved into a house in Braintree, Massachusetts. In 1792, that part of Braintree split off and became known as Quincy, Massachusetts, named after Abigail's maternal grandfather, Colonel John Quincy, a soldier and a politician. This pastel portrait of ben by Benjamin Blythe was painted a year after the birth of Abigail's first child, Nabby. It depicts a confident and intelligent young woman with dark penetrating eyes. She wears a pearl necklace, which is a strand of faux pearls with ribbon fasteners. This necklace is believed to be the one in the collection of the Smithsonian Institution and may even have been her wedding pearls. There is a similar necklace in the Mount Vernon archives, and we saw Martha in her miniature wearing pearls the same way. The fact that the pearls are artificial is of no consequence. Real pearls in the colonies were rare, except for those little seed pearls, as I mentioned earlier. Those opposed to the system of taxation imposed by the crown felt it their patriotic duty to avoid luxury items from Great Britain. The likely source of Abigail's imitation pearls is France where several recipes for affordable pearl substitutes were developed in the 17th century and continued into the 18th century. Worn high on the neck, as in this portrait, they represented the height of fashion in the second half of the 18th century. During the first eight years of her marriage, Abigail had six children. Two of them did not survive childhood. While tensions between Great Britain and the colonies escalated, John built his law practice, participated in local politics, and wrote newspaper articles on constitutional matters. When he was elected as representative to the Massachusetts legislature, 
late, let us, sorry, legislature, Abigail managed the household and farm and wrote him many letters. If you have seen the musical or the movie 1776, you'll know it was partially based on their letters. With John's appointment to the Second Continental Congress in Philadelphia, Abigail took on added responsibilities at home, collecting rents from tenants and hiring farmhands during an acute labor shortage. Abigail regarded the role of wife and mother as the highest calling for women. Her progressive advocacy for the humane treatment of women developed out of a desire to elevate women's traditional role in society. In November, 1777, John was appointed the commissioner of France, an important ally during the Revolutionary War. He took his son, John Quincy, along with him. He was only 10 years old. And of course he was our future sixth president. As a parting gift, John gave Abigail a navette shaped ornament. I'm showing it rather large here so you can read what's on the plaque. It was a pendant with a miniature allegorical scene painted on ivory and set in a golden gold frame. The painting shows a woman dressed in a white gown seated on the shoreline beneath the tree. She gazes at the ship sailing in the distance as she rests her arm on a tablet inscribed, I yield to whatever is right. In the foreground is an anchor, a symbol of hope and steadfastness. The reverse of the miniature contains a lock of hair under glass. The plaited hair belongs to John, while the initials AA cut from sheet gold and placed over the hair are Abigail's. Over the next several years, John was home only intermittently. In September, 1779, Congress appointed him to negotiate peace with Great Britain. The full responsibility of managing the family's finances and properties once again fell on Abigail. In 1784, Abigail and Nabby joined John in Europe. They settled into a house on the outskirts of Paris. The significant attention that French women paid to fashion disturbed Abigail, who was usually dressed plainly, as you can see here. However, she and Nabby occasionally visited, visited shops in Paris and a gold watch with an enamel scene on one side was purchased and remained a valued possession throughout her life. Uh, it's a little hard to see the picture, but it's the best I can find. The timepiece was passed down in the family and is now part of the Adams National Historical Park collection. In 1785, John became the minister to the court of St. James, where all foreign ambass ambassadors are received in London. Abigail accompanied him wearing a dress of white silk trimmed with white crepe, lilac ribbon, and white lace with a large hoop and a three-foot train. Her accessories included a lace cap with two white plumes, a lace handkerchief, pearl earrings, a pearl necklace, and two pearl hairpins. In March, 1789, John was selected to be the first vice president of the United States. And for the next eight years, they made their home in the country's capital, initially located in New York City and then in Philadelphia. In 1795, Abigail ordered miniatures of her oldest and youngest sons who were then living in The Hague, the governmental seat of the Netherlands. After graduating from Harvard College, John Quincy Adams, her oldest son, became a lawyer. At age 26, he was appointed as minister to the Netherlands. Thomas Boylston Adams, her third and youngest son, worked as a secretary to his brother. Like Martha Washington's miniatures, there are holes in the frames, but Abigail wore her miniatures on ribbons where they would have been sewn on. John Adams became the second president of the United States on March 4th, 1797. Abigail did not go to the inauguration. She arrived in Philadelphia several months later. And that same year, her third son, Charles, died at age 30 of alcoholism. In November 1800, the Adams moved into the president's house, later known as the White House. They were the first presidential couple to do so. Abigail considered the residence a grand tribute to the presidency, despite its incomplete and totally unfurnished state. That's why she was able to hang her laundry there. The couple lived there for only a few months as John lost the second election to Thomas Jefferson. They were consoled, no doubt, by the knowledge that after numerous long separations during their marriage, they would spend their final years together. 
There is one other important jewelry story about existing jewelry that I want to tell you that's related to Abigail. Later in her life, she became estranged from her friend, the writer Mercy Otis Warren. Warren published a history of the American Revolution, and in it she criticized some aspects of John Adams' administration. Several years of silence between the friends followed until a mutual friend, statesman, and founding father, Elbridge Jerry, orchestrated a reconciliation. By the way, the word gerrymander references him, and he was to become the vice president under James Madison. Two ornaments with hair enclosed in them were commissioned by Abigail when the friendship was renewed. One is a gold brooch containing a lock of hair that Mercy had sent her. The initials MW are placed over the hair, which is covered by a crystal and bordered by 35 seed pearls. A gold ring contains combined hair of Abigail and John and their initials in gold foil. Abigail died in her home on October 28, 1818 of typhoid fever. She is buried beside her husband who died eight years later at the age of 90 in a crypt located in the United First Parish Church in Quincy. She was 73 years old. Abigail wrote some 1,200 letters to John while chronicling the events of her time. Through her extensive writings, she provided a firsthand account of the revolutionary period for future generations, at the same time demonstrating her piercing intelligence and resourcefulness. And I wanted to show you some experts, excerpts from her will uh, because they pertain to jewelry. First of all, she gives a lot of her clothing to those in her will. Then she leaves her gold watch to her granddaughter, Susanna. She divides some of her earrings top and bottom between two granddaughters, just like Martha Washington probably did. And she divides a gold chain between two granddaughters. Down here, she uh, removes, uh, she returns um, jewelry that was memorial jewelry from family members that was given to her. She gives them back. And she also leaves several people money uh, to have memorial rings made. Dolly Madison was the wife of James Madison, the fourth president of the United States, who served from 1809 to 1817. For almost a century, Dolly was one of the most important women in the social circus circles of America. She remains to this day one of the best known and best loved women of the White House according to the White House Historical Association. Dolly Payne was born in 1768 to John and Mary Payne, Quakers who lived in Piedmont, North Carolina, and then later Virginia. In 1783, the year the Civil War and the Revolutionary War ended, the family moved to Philadelphia, a city with a large Quaker population. The move was partly because her father wanted to emancipate his slaves and that was illegal in Virginia. Being a Quaker, Dolly was not allowed to wear adornments, which she yearned for. Her maternal grandmother, who was not a Quaker, gave her a little pouch with some jewelry in it and showed her how to pin it inside her dress where her parents couldn't see it. When it was lost at some point in her young life, she mourned her loss for some time. At the age of 22, Dolly, at her father's urging, married a lawyer named John Todd Jr., also a Quaker, and they had two sons. Three years later, John and one of her sons died of yellow fever, leaving Dolly a widow with little money. She and her son moved into her mother's boarding house. At this time, Philadelphia was the capital of this country and it was an exciting place to be. Aaron Burr was a boarder who befriended Dolly and introduced her to James Madison, an up and coming politician. Although Virginia Representative James Madison was 17 years her senior and an Episcopalian, Dolly agreed to his marriage proposal and they were married September 15, 1794. She was expelled from the Society of Friends for marrying outside her faith and she began to attend Episcopal services as well as starting to wear bright colored dresses and jewelry. This miniature of Dolly was painted by Charles Wilson Peale around the time she married James. It said they sealed the engagement with an exchange of miniatures, but I don't know where the one of James is or if it still exists. This miniature of James was given to a former fiance, 
Kitty Floyd, and then she married somebody else. And note that Dolly is wearing um, a miniature around her neck. And it could be James, it could be her son, we don't know. This is Dolly's engagement ring and it's in the collection of the Montpelier Foundation, James Madison's plantation, which is now a museum. It's set with six rose cut diamonds and you'll notice that it looks just like that ring at Mount Vernon. A number of sources state that James gave Dolly a micro mosaic necklace as a wedding gift. Its whereabouts are unknown, but it would have looked much like this one. These necklaces were made in Italy and were popular with wealthy people doing the grand tour of Europe, both Europeans and Americans. They would bring these home as souvenirs. And the designs, you can barely see, but it's little tiny pieces of glass that are fit together very tightly. And those little pieces of glass are known as tesserae. It's also been written that Nellie Madison, her mother-in-law, gave her a number of pieces of jewelry that had been in the family. And it has been said that James bought Dolly quite a bit of jewelry. One biographer describes Dolly's favorite earrings as having the letter M carved in amethyst, hung on gold chains, and also says she had earrings and necklaces of carbuncles and seed pearls. Carbuncles are unfaceted garnets with a rounded top. None of this jewelry is known today, but Dolly had to sell most of her things at the end of her life. It's also known that a niece who has left some of Dolly's jewelry sold it at auction. This lovely portrait of Dolly was painted five years before she became first lady. As in her miniature, it appears she's wearing three chains around her neck, but it's likely one long chain that's been wrapped around. Long chains were quite popular at this time. She's wearing an Ampere um, style dress, which I'll talk about more, and her hair is uncovered. The painting dates to three years after James Madison was appointed to serve for eight years as President Jefferson's Secretary of State. By that time, Dolly had made her home the center of society in Washington. She also assisted at the White House when Jefferson asked for help in receiving guests. His wife had died before he became president. When James became president in 1809, Dolly presided over the first ever inaugural ball in Washington. She wore a buff colored velvet gown with a long train and a complete set of pearls, necklace, bracelet, and earrings, and a feather accented turban of velvet and satin. Through her husband's two terms, Dolly held regular social events, including levees or receptions. She could skillfully entertain a group of very diverse people and everyone had a good time. At the turn of the 18th into the 19th century, Dolly began following French fashion. By doing so, she was wearing more revealing clothing than she ever had in her life. The French Empire style was patterned after Empress Josephine's dresses. Her husband, Napoleon Bonaparte, had a passionate interest in classical Greece and Rome, which led to this style of dress with the waist under the bust, short puffy sleeves, often of a sheer material and low cut. In addition, Dolly adapted the French style of wearing a turban, much to James chagrin, and decorated them with feathers, flowers, and sometimes jewels. A crescent brooch, which would have looked like the one I'm showing you, has been mentioned in several sources. This painting shows Dolly with James at one of her receptions. In reality, she was four inches taller than him, so the artist treated James kindly here. Here is another image of Dolly in a dress in the umpire style. If you look in the detail uh, right here, you can see a brooch. Numerous accounts mention her owning amethyst jewelry and this might be an amethyst brooch. The lady below is Elizabeth Bonaparte. She and Dolly ran in the same social circus and were friends. Elizabeth also helped popularize the French style of dress in Washington but Elizabeth was looking towards France for a special reason. She was from a prominent family in Baltimore and had met Jerome Bonaparte, Napoleon's younger brother, when his naval ship was docked there. Against the wishes of her father and Napoleon, they married. When Napoleon's coronation was to take place, they boarded a ship to France, but Napoleon would not let her step on French soil. And she was pregnant at the time. 
Eventually, uh, Jerome married someone Napoleon chose for him. Dolly tried to intercede on Elizabeth's behalf, which strained relations with France. But Elizabeth was never to see Jerome again and raised her son alone. Her grandson actually became the Secretary of the Navy under Teddy Roosevelt. Um, an interesting note, Elizabeth was more daring than Dolly. She followed the practice of women in the French court who wet their dresses to make them more clingy and revealing. Aaron Burr once said of her scant clothing that he could put his entire dress in her pocket, his pocket. Dolly was the first truly public hostess as first lady. Her social graces made her famous. She was known for holding social functions for which she astutely invited both members of the two political parties at the same time. Previously, Thomas Jefferson would only meet with members of one party at a time. And politics often led to heated discussions which could even end in physical altercations when the parties clashed. And you might remember that Aaron Burr sh um, sh shot Alexander Hamilton. One way Dolly was inclusive was to invite everyone to take a pinch of her snuff, which is pulverized tobacco, which you then sniffed up your nose. This silver snuff box is in the collection of Montpelier and James boxes below. Her tortoiseshell box is in the collection of the James Madison Museum of Orange, Virginia. I found many descriptions of her snuff bottles, so I believe she had a number of them in different materials, and they were considered to be an important fashion accessory. This watch is an ornament that belonged to Dolly that was recently acquired by Montpelier. She would have worn it on a chain around her neck or at her waist. The face of the watch is what's known as an engine turn design. These are two of her gold bracelets that were handed down in her family. The wider one has a yellow decoration, which is a black substance inlaid into engraving. During James' presidency, war with England was brewing again in what became known as the War of 1812. Dolly received word from her husband to leave the White House as the British forces were approaching. She famously had servants take down the life-size portrait of George Washington and remove it from the White House. Although it was only a copy of the original known as the Lansdowne portrait, she thought it would be bad optics if it fell into the hands of the British. This painting still hangs in the White House today. Forced to flee the White House, she returned to find it in ruins, burned down by British soldiers. Undaunted by living in temporary quarters as it was being rebuilt, she entertained an octagon house, a museum today. After James' second term as president was completed, the J Madisons went to live at their plantation Montpelier in Virginia, where they continued to entertain. They had not lived there since James became Secretary of State 16 years earlier. One of the reasons Dolly had felt secure in marrying James was because he took care of her son Payne. As Payne grew to be an adult, he was to mishandle his own affairs due to alcoholism and a gambling habit. In 1830, Payne went to debtor's prison. The Madison sold land in Kentucky and mortgaged half of the Montpelier plantation to pay his debts. In 1836, James Madison died at the age of 85. Dolly's niece, Payne, came to live with her. Anna Payne came to live with her. During this time, Dolly organized and copied her husband's papers as Congress had authorized a $55,000 payment for the editing and publishing of seven volumes of the Madison Papers. But Dolly was in so much debt, this did not get her out from underneath it. In the fall of 1837, Dolly returned to Washington to live with her sister, Anna Cutts. She was still well-received socially, and she left the running of Montpelier to her son, Payne. She was eventually forced to sell Montpelier because of Payne's mismanagement. Dolly remained in serious financial trouble for the rest of her life, and was forced to sell almost everything she owned. Although she had updated her clothing from the Empire style as it went out of style, she had to socialize at the end of her life in old clothes. In 1848, Congress agreed to buy the rest of James Madison's papers for $25,000, which was put in trust to keep Payne from squandering it. Dolly only got a small amount, which allowed her to reclaim her silver knives and a gold chain she had pawned for $20. Dolly died a year later in 1849 at age 81. 
Her funeral was attended by all the important people in Washington. She had known every president from George Washington to James Polk, 10 presidents beside her husband. Her son Payne died two years after her. We're lucky that Dolly lived long enough to be photographed. Here are two daguerreotypes by Matthew Brady, one with her niece, Anna, and one with President James Polk. Mary Todd Lincoln was one of the most tragic first ladies in my opinion. Her losses began at an early age when her mother died when she was seven. Her father remarried a woman who was indifferent to Mary and she was shipped off to boarding school. In fact, her stepmother once called her the devil's spawn because she was so high spirited. Mary had a total of 16 brothers and sisters, sisters from her father's two marriage. So it would have been hard not to be overlooked in the best of circumstances. Although she grew up with luxury, she was lacking in love. She escaped her stepmother by moving to Springfield, Illinois to live with her sister. There she met young Abe Lincoln, a struggling lawyer. Although her family found him unattractive, Mary saw something in him. They were engaged to be married and then Abe backed out at the last minute. Mary was devastated. After dating secretly again, with just a day's notice, Mary and Abe were married on the evening of November 4th, 1842, in the parlor of her sister Elizabeth Edwards. Mary wore a wedding dress that belonged to her sister Frances and a pearl necklace. Reverend Charles Dresser, an Episcopalian minister, performed the ceremony, which included two bridesmaids. Mary's gold wedding ring was inscribed with the words, A.L. to Mary, November 4th, 1842. Love is eternal. They seem to have had a good marriage. Mary helped Abe to become more polished as he became a successful lawyer and then a politician. She bore him four sons that she loved deeply. The Lincolns were heartbroken when their son Eddie died at age four of tuberculosis in 1850, but they had consolation in the birth of Tad in 1851 and Willie in 1853. In 1861, the Lincolns experienced the triumph of Abe being elected as president. This is Mary in her inauguration gown and her inauguration jewelry. President Lincoln, oh, sorry, I went too far. President Lincoln purchased the jewelry for her from Tiffany and Company. According to Tiffany's records, Abe paid $180 for the necklace and $350 for the two bracelets. The necklace and bracelets were donated to the Library of Congress in 1937 by Mary's granddaughter, Mary Lincoln Isham. Wrong direction. Okay. As first lady, Mary liked to wear ball gowns with long trains and low cut shoulders. Her husband once said she needed a little less tail and a little more neck. She was also known for wearing elaborate floral headpieces and one senator in a letter to his wife described her as looking as if she was wearing a flower pot on her head. But note, she's wearing the inauguration jewelry again here. And this is Elizabeth Keckley, Mary's dressmaker, who made this dress. Um, you will see that she became very important in Mary's life. It was not all social events and balls for Mary as first lady, although she did love to entertain. The civil war was raging and the country was divided. Mary's own brothers fought for the Confederacy, putting her in a terrible position. Her own family was suspicious of her, as were Northerners. Her half-brothers, Alec and Sam, both died during the fighting for the South, as did her brother-in-law, Benjamin Helm. Mary was criticized no matter what she did, for spending money to fix up the White House during wartime, for being a traitor to the South, and for not entertaining in 1862 after she lost another son, Willie, at age 11. She shut herself off from the world then and went into deep mourning for some time. Mary was a shopaholic. Whether it was part of some compulsion from a form of mental illness, we will never know. She bought household items, china, silver, clothing, accessories like gloves and fans, and jewelry in great quantities. Uh, the bracelet at the top that we see here uh, I haven't actually seen in person. The Smithsonian lists it as being stone with diamonds, but I'm relatively certain it's blue enamel, which would have been the style at the time. And just interesting note, the bracelet was reproduced in the 1990s by the Avon Company. 
Her diamond pendant is said to have been a gift from Abe. It has a glass compartment on the back, which might have once held some of his hair or one of her son's. And that pendant has also been copied. These are her lorgnettes. And I'm showing you an image of Mary wearing a gold watch on a gold chain. To my knowledge, its whereabouts are not known. Unfortunately, as first lady, Mary got credit with merchants to spend money the Lincolns simply didn't have. I think she needed to fill a hole in her heart from her losses, and she attempted to do it with material goods. When Abe Lincoln appeared ready to win a second term, she bought a 508-piece set of china, 300 pairs of white kid gloves, and from Galton Brothers, the Tiffany and Company of Washington, D.C., she spent $2,888.50 on pearl, amethyst, and diamond jewelry. The greatest tragedy of her life happened on April 14, 1865, when her husband was fatally shot by John Wilkes Booth. Mary really never recovered from the event. She shut herself away in the White House while looting went on. The only person she would let in to see her was Elizabeth Keckley. Eventually, she was told she would have to move out as the new president, Andrew Johnson, was moving in. Here is Mary in morning, morning clothes and onyx and pearl jewelry, which would have been suitable for mourning. She wore this dress when Willie died. Mourning etiquette would require a widow to dress in black and wear dark jewelry for a year. Mary would have worn the same type of dress, if not this exact one, when Abe died. The onyx watch is said to have been purchased after Abe's death, and the other jewelry could be from earlier mourning. Mary would continue to dress in mourning for the next 17 years, much as Queen Victoria did the same to mourn Prince Albert. This gold scarf pin was found when Mary died. I'm not sure if she actually wore it, and I wonder whether it might have been a gift from someone. It's not the kind of thing I think she would have bought. It's Lincoln's head against a laurel wreath and a cross. She also had another ring that's still surviving, which is in the collection of the Smithsonian Institution, but there's no photograph of it available. When Mary came out of her catatonic state, she realized she had debts to pay for which she lacked funds. First, she went to Galt's and other prestigious jewelers and asked to return items she never used. Galt's allowed her to do so. Next, she went to New York City with Elizabeth Keckley. She was traveling incognito as Mrs. Clark. She picked diamond broker W.H. Brady out of the newspaper and asked him to sell her things. But he recognized her, and unfortunately, the firm published her letters in Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper. This diamond suite, a brooch and earrings, was pictured in the story down here. I have to say the shape of the box looks different, and I don't know if that was just an illustration or the box was changed. The sale became known as Mrs. Lincoln's old clothes scandal and brought her very little money. Congress was furious that she was embarrassing the government. She had asked them to provide a pension to first ladies whose husbands died in office, but it wasn't until the end of her life they finally granted her a $3,000 pension. This brooch and earrings were brought <clears throat> were bought by the Museum of Fine Arts Boston a number of years ago. Mary had been asking $340 for them, and the MFA paid $24,150. Mary eventually received some money from Abe's estate. She bought a house she couldn't afford and before long had to sell it. Then Mary set sail for Europe with Tad. Robert was an adult and on his own by then. She wandered around Europe, attending seances and living in several places. Mary was invited to be presented to the court of St. James in 1871, and apparently she shed her mourning clothes, clothing temporarily and wore a white dress with a coral sash. It's believed she wore this coral jewelry with carved angels with it. It's been suggested the angels represented her husband and her two sons. There's one on each of these parts too. I'm rather skeptical as carved coral jewelry with angels was ubiquitous in the 19th century. She also owned the red coral bead necklace and these pendant earrings. The earrings have been converted to screwbacks, which were not in use until the 20th century. So a relative must have done this later on to be able to wear them. Mary and Tad returned from Europe after several years, excuse me, in 1871 and another tragedy. Tad died that year at age six, 18. For the next several years, Mary traveled to various places in the United States including Florida. 
In 1875, Robert had his mother committed to an asylum, fearing she was not sane. She was eventually released into the custody of her sister Elizabeth. Mary then went to live in France for several years, but returned to live with her sister as her health was failing. She did reconcile with Robert at some point and was thrilled to have two grandchildren. Mary spent her final days living in her sister's home where she had married. She was surrounded by her trunks full of things she no longer needed, old ball gowns, ball gowns and a collection of gloves that would rival Imelda Marco's shoes. Mary died on July 16, 1882. She was buried in a white dress at her request, and it's believed she was wearing her wedding ring. She rests in the same crypt as her husband and children. Robert's children played with some of her gowns and cut up pieces to give to their friends. The children of some of her siblings received some of her jewelry, and some undoubtedly went to Robert, as his daughter Mary Isham donated the inaugural C. Pearl Joy to the Library of Congress, and Lincoln Isham, her son, donated several pieces of jewelry to the Smithsonian Institution, including the onyx lapel watch and the blue enamel bracelet with diamonds. Before I end this lecture, there is something I feel I should discuss. Our early first ladies had many important attributes and they set precedents for future first ladies. Learning about their jewelry tells us quite a bit about them and how they established the role of first lady. But it should be said that two of these first ladies, Martha Washington and Dolly Madison, had no problem owning slaves to maintain their wealth through the running of their plantations, which allowed them a privileged standard of living and they brought slaves to work in the president's home as well. As Mary Jenkins Schwartz points out in her book, Ties That Bound, for Founding First Ladies and Slaves, those slaves who were personal attendants to them would have been required to help them get into their fine clothes in addition to all their other duties. And perhaps they even handled their jewelry as well. I think we need to look at Martha Washington and Dolly Madison, not just as the owners of adornments and the wives of presidents who carved out the role of the first lady. We must ponder the paradox of them being the wives of men who preached equal rights for all men and yet owned slaves. It's part of their story. Abigail Adams and John Adams did not own slaves, but Abigail tasked with running a farm while her husband was away for long periods of time, hired freed slaves to work for her and she paid them. Also at times she hired slaves belonging to others and paid their masters for their work. It was later in life she became an ardent abolitionist. There is one positive thing to say. Mary Todd Lincoln grew up in a wealthy slave owning family. Historians say her position on slavery is uncertain, but Elizabeth Keckley, Mary's dressmaker, confidant, and a free black woman noted in her autobiography that Mary donated the seed money for the Contraband Relief Association, an organization that provided assistance to black people fleeing slavery in the South during the Civil War. The organization was founded by Keckley and some of her church members. I hope that you have learned, enjoyed learning about the jewelry of our first ladies. Thank you so much, Elise, oh. for that. Um, especially those final comments, I think it's really important to note that about um, those first ladies and their connection to enslavement. Um, I wanted, I have a few questions that are specific um, that have rolled through to some of the slides you were sharing, but I also have some general questions. And one was um, looking at all these early first ladies and thinking about their jewelry um, and traveling in the summer. Are there sites, presidential sites or first lady related sites that are connected to these first ladies that you recommend people check out if they wanted to see jewelry? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, well, first of all, Mount Vernon, of course, because a lot of the jewelry is on view. <clears throat> Montpelier has several pieces on view, and a lot of them have dresses or recreated dresses. Um, let me think where else. I mean, later first ladies, there are definitely places as well. I'm just trying to think. Oh, yeah, the Adams Homestead in, in Massachusetts has her watch and her, um, her pearls. And um, Mary Todd Lincoln, there's several places. There's the Lincoln Museum. There's also um, 
it's called the Lincoln Museum of Orange County, Virginia. And I'm sorry, I'm mixing up. There, there's several. There's several museums for Lincoln. Um, that one was for um, James Madison, the Orange County. Um, so I would. Look, there are books that list all the presidential sites. I highly mm -hmm. recommend buying one. It'll list the home sites, the museums, the libraries, etc. Um, I was so fascinated with the story about the pearls related to Abigail Adams and um, women during the revolution, not wanting to spend a lot and um, creating faux pearls, because as we get into the 20th century, it made me think of Barbara Bush and how um, similarly she refused to wear. Right. Well, it wasn't just Barbara Bush. It was also um, Mamie Eisenhower and Jackie Kennedy. Mm -hmm. They all wore faux pearls. But they were, they were, um, these were made in Europe and there were actually, there's a long description of how they were made. I wanted to include it, but there just wasn't time. Yeah. But they, they used fish scales and they created some kind of goo and then they for, put it in a ball and then they put something on the outside. There were several different ways to do it, but they were small. They weren't the size that you would see today in costume jewelry. Can you tell us a little bit more about the tradition of um, mourning jewelry? I was sure. really fascinated about this idea of leaving um, money behind for people to have mourning um, jewelry design in, in the well, well. I never heard of that. Uh, well, the jewelry is very common in the 18th and 19th centuries. Mm -hmm. And there was also jewelry that was woven from hair from people. It wasn't always for death. Sometimes it was just to remember somebody who was going far away or something like that. But it was extremely common to leave money in your will, give my nephew $10 so that he can have a ring made with my hair in it. Fascinating. So there's a lo lot of that jewelry around in museums. One of the other questions that came up was um, reproduction jewelry related to the first ladies. Uh, is there reproduction jewelry um, out there? Being yes, I talked about two of them there. Um, Mary Todd Lincoln's bracelet was reproduced and um, that diamond pendant that she had, both have been reproduced. But it's an interesting story. There's a pair of earrings that are supposedly Dolly Madison's that have been reproduced and they're sold everywhere in every museum. And I actually bought a pair because how could I resist? But the originals are in a museum and I contacted the museum because they didn't look right to me, but I thought, what do I know? Let me find out. And they were given by a man who said they were Dolly Madison's with no proof. But those have been reproduced and they're everywhere. So there's lots of people thinking they have reproductions of Dolly Madison's. Wow. Some of Jackie Kennedy's jewelry has been reproduced too. Sure. Um, I, was, I was also really interested in this idea of like, you know, a lot of this jewelry we were talking is hard hard to access, it's hard to come by. How often are photographs and uh, portraits uh, documents that you use to research jewelry? It's, we do use it, but it's tough. Um, a lot of times they didn't wear their jewelry and portraits before photography. And sometimes the artist would supply jewelry for the sitter to wear. Mm -hmm. Like he'd have a box of jewelry and say, I think this necklace would look good with that dress. So it's not even her jewelry. It can send us off in the wrong direction. Um, as far as photographs, that's a lot more helpful. But the early first lady saw black and white photography and you can't figure out what they're wearing. Uh -huh. So it's not really till we get to color photography or really good portraits that we can try to track down the jewelry. Well, Elise, thank you so much for sharing this part one of early, for early first My pleasure. Lady, and we're very excited to um, hear part two. So uh, we will send out a link to everyone who participated in today's talk uh, so that they can follow along um, and register for the next one. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for joining us today, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you again next month. Have a great day.